I'd like to call to order the October 4th special meeting of the Everett Public School Board of Directors to order. Will the secretary to read, please read the roll? Uh, President, Present. Our first item of the of business is the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Sosson, would you introduce this evening's agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public this evening. This afternoon's agenda contains a segment for the board to receive at the start of school update. Thank you very much, Dr. Sosson. If all directors are in agreement, the agenda will be approved by general consent. Very well. well sh we shall now move on to our work study session. And I see the presenter, uh, the first presenter, Dr. Scott, is at the podium. Thank you, President Hussain and the Board of Directors and Dr. Salzman. It's our privilege tonight to discuss the start of school update. I'm going to kind of serve as the MC here in this or conversational atmosphere. So please feel free to um, ask questions along the way. We're gonna build in our discussion time. Um, the design is that the discussion time is actually built into the segment. So please know that. And then please don't hesitate to ask questions along the way as well. Here's the lineup. And I want to save time for the actual presenters, but to try to give you kind of a high uh, altitude overview of what we want to do and how we want to engage you tonight around the start of school update around these pieces here. This question about uh, in what ways is this school year different? And in what ways do we do we hope it's going to be different? We want to um, ask you that in a couple of minutes here. Um, we want to talk about our strategy as we frame this, the 22-23 school year in terms of hope and optimism plus strategies. That's one of those undercurrents there. So hope and optimism by themselves is insufficient. We know that hope is not in and of itself a strategy, but hope and optimism is of ultimate importance with the employment of strategies. And we are so fortunate to have a strategic plan that you all have helped us build and endorse to move that work forward. And that's what we're going to illustrate here tonight. We're going to highlight key strategies here around student achievement. You're going to see a date, but if you've ever wondered what happens on a lid day at, at the end of August, early September, you're going to get kind of a, uh, a, a fly on the wall perspective there. The annual cadence of the school year and how we built that out. And then some uh, pieces on the 90 day plans that you've been hearing about at the instructional reviews. We're also going to talk about uh, revisiting what we want every student to experience in the classroom. So this is that instructional vision that is, is, is unpacked in our strategic initiatives. We're going to touch on that. We're going to talk about student progress monitoring against grade level standards. We're going to talk about that social emotional learning basis as well, so that students can bring their full and true selves to the classroom. We're going to highlight some operational pieces next, technology enhancements, um, some of the tools that enhance teaching and learning in the classroom, followed by a, an enrollment update, uh, communications update, and building out that two-way communication with our, our community and listening to them in ways that, that we uh, attempted to do during the pandemic with some limitations um, and where we want to really double down in terms of uh, taking advantage of being in person again. And, and that's something to really, really <coughs> celebrate because we know that our community is hungry for that, our administrators are hungry for that, and we want to capitalize on that, that piece there. So I want to pause here and, and open it up to you all in terms of this. This is a, a high altitude question, or set of questions. In what ways is, as you've noticed it, in sort of the start of school launch, say since, since June and July, looking to the 22-23 school year, in what ways is this school year different? And then interchangeably here, and you can start on either one of these questions, in what ways do you hope that it will be different? I, I, I know I've talked to a couple of seniors, both seniors in high school and seniors in college, about you know what the past three years have been like for them. And isn't it special that they get 
and I'm saying this in air quotes, um, a real senior year with no restrictions that are happening right now. Um, you know, everything should happen. Um, maybe you can speak to this, Jen, it's, but it's, it's, it feels more real. And then um, being in the schools for, the, you know, for, for, for the, the IR today and then being at Penny Creek just for a visit, you know, seeing, seeing mass by choice. And, um, you know, it's, it's not everyone, it's not everywhere, but it, it just seems the, I just see a lot of joy happening right yeah. now. And I heard a lot of stress at Penny Creek today. Um, you'll get the enrollment update. <laughs> um, but it seems like they've weathered the storm. So it is just sort of that perseverance is in that fortitude that I think the pandemic, I, I, I think I'm seeing it in action. I can say that from some of the parents that I've talked to, the ways in which this school year, is, their expectations from this school year is how are we going to bring the kids back up? They're concerned that in the past couple years, even though we had, you know, online learning, some schools did not, and um, you know, throughout the country, and some kids were missing um, the schools. Even though they were there, they were still missing school, the building, the structure. Uh, the concern is how are we going to give kids that lift back up to school, what school is supposed to be, at school, engaging, uh, a celebration at the end for what they have accomplished during the year, because a lot of parents do feel that their, their kids missed something in the last couple of years as far as education and how are we going to bring them back up to where they should be? Um, both of those, I, I think there's a, a recognition of this, how, in what ways the school year is different, that there's some making up for the last few years, um, academics, uh, performance, and there's that recognition. Um, my hope is that there won't be too much stress on staff. The, the fierce urgency, yes, but I, I hope that there's also, we can do this. And I think that's gonna be talked about tonight um, because I think there is a heavy lift that our schools are feeling, but also the excitement of getting back in person is, um, is really felt by our families and students and that's, it's such a joy. Yeah, yeah. I, I sense both of those. And, um, you know, to me, it's it's kind of the question is how do we heal also from the past three years? Because um, it, you know, there's excitement about moving forward, but we're carrying a lot of um, difficulty from the past forward, both students and adults in the classroom and in the buildings. And um, how do we support that? I think, I think hope this year or um, really the, the impact of the, the pandemic on the social emotional health of our staff, um, the overburden, I heard that at Penny Creek today, um, the, the IR seems to be not, not, not appearing to be engaged. Um, I think that the, the ruler training that, that for the lit day that I look forward to attending, um, I think Panorama showed it at gateway some gaps and in how teachers connect, but also um, I just I wonder about the mental health of our students and staff and and I just hope this year um, that 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 it gets better. I mean that just we see some improvements built in panorama and in services kids can get, not that they haven't been getting services, but lack of counselors, lack of stuff. I just I hope that the kids are mentally safe. And the staff. Any other thoughts? I'd like to second that too. The, the hope, how will it be different? We were able to engage our staff rather quickly with, with remote learning. And that was really good. That put a lot of burden on our staff. The hope is that our staff still have that love of education, that love of being in the classroom, because so many staff members, you know, after being over 
overburdened and overworked. We just hope that they did not lose that love of education and look are now looking for other career paths. I hope they still retain that love of education and love of teaching because they did an awesome job really quick when a lot of people did not. But we, we jumped in with both feet and we really pushed them hard. And so my concern is that they still have that love of teaching, love of education. Thank you for sharing. We'll, we'll keep moving here. Really appreciate your, your thoughts, particularly around that, that hope and optimism. And what, what you're going to see is, is that combined with strategies, building out a theory of action about what really drives and generates the, the big why of, of what, what we're, why we're doing what we're doing. And it's not just the people in this room, right? We, we have a coalition. We have 2,500 folks here uh, driving in the same direction, led by our strategic plan, uh, led by fantastic, stable leadership, uh, and, and keeping our eye on the prize of student achievement. And that really is the road. All roads lead back to student achievement. Uh, one, of the, one of the frames that we use to start the school year is this, this concept from, this, this particular concept is not um, unique to the book, Good to Great, but it's in it. In fact, it, it comprises a whole chapter of it. It was really a connector for a lot of our administrators, and I think from some, from some of our teachers too, as we reconciled what we've been experiencing through the pandemic and questioning, hey, I had some hope and optimism last year, and then we had Omicron. I had some hope and optimism and, and strategies, and then we encountered this. So how do you lead in a time of uncertainty? And I don't think anybody in this room thinks that the uncertainty is over. That and, and some of us would argue that just working in education, there's always been an undercurrent of uncertainty through financial times and, and, and upswings and downswings and things um, throughout the years. How do we approach that as, as leaders? How do we approach that as educators? So the author here talks about every good to great organization embracing what they call the Stockdale paradox which is that we must maintain an un unwavering faith that we can and will prevail in the end. And that's what we're celebrating. And I think we heard that in, in each of your um, responses, that together we can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties, and it's not an or, but an and at the same time, have the discipline to confront the facts of our reality, right? As difficult or whatever they might be. Right? So how, what does that actually mean for us? Taking that frame, you're going to hear a little bit more about the frame. Dr. Salzman has, has um, talked about this frame many, many times in front of the leadership core, in front of teachers, in front of all sorts of work groups. Clarity, context, and candor. Clarity around our, our current situation. And you've heard it in some of these preliminary instructional reviews. Clarity might take the form of something like this. We have six out of kid, 10 kids meeting standard in ELA. We may have five out of 10 kids meeting standard in that's clear. And that, it, that should and does drive sort of this visceral reaction that we have work to do, right? We have work to do. The context might sound something like our students outperformed their contemporaries in neighboring districts. And in some cases, 10, 15, 20, 25 percent, our students outperformed their contemporaries in, in, in neighboring districts. And while that might cause us pause and ask why and some, some reason to say, great job, way to go, right? Way to go. We still, that candor piece coming back to yes and, right? We still have four out of 10 kids not being standard here. In some cases, it might be eight out of 10 kids not being standard here. So that's this reality, context, reality, generating movement and action. This has worked really well, and you're going to see that this as an, un, as an undercurrent. And the fortunate thing here is in, in, you know, we need to continue to lean into those, those facts that have caused some discomfort. Keep leaning in, applying resources, applying strategies, mobilizing people. 
this really is a distillation of our theory of action. It, 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 it's a fancy way of saying, essentially, if we do these things, we believe we're going to see improvements in student achievement. And fortunately, and by design, we would say that these things are front and center in our strategic plan, which is fantastic. So if we lead for consistent implementation of tier one instructional strategies, if we continue to progress monitor with fidelity, and not just progress monitor as, a, as, as the ultimate end, that's a, that's a practice as a means to the end of generating some systems level, school level response to what the data is showing, right? And then that undercurrent of social emotional supports and innovative practices. If we do those things, if we lead for those priorities, we will see continued gains in student achievement. We, we firmly believe that. So that is the framing and the set um, for this evening. And I uh, pass it here to Dr. Woods. Please. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank you all for. Um, I feel like I, I have a real privilege. I am excited to provide you with a glimpse of a day in the life um, of school staff as they um, kicked off the school year on August 31st and September 1st. Um, they had nine hours over those two days of professional learning led by their principals in kicking off the school year with that whole plus optimism plus strategies um, equal student improvement. And um, when you were talking about that, that, the hopes that you have for, um, for staff this year, I wish you had been a fly on the wall in some of these uh, learning improvement days. It was, it, um, it was pretty awesome. So kind of a frame here. What they all had in common were these things. Um, there was a principal welcome and framing and setting that tone of optimism and strategies <coughs> and fun combined with that fierce urgency of that. Um, they worked on building culture and climate while focusing on those systems and instruction that are going to lead to um, student improvement and student uh, achievement. There was a focus on leading with data with that frame of clarity, context, and candor. I'm going to share an example of that. A focus on high quality standards aligned, what we call tier one instruction. That means instruction that is accessible to all students at grade level standard. Um, progress monitoring, so a system of monitoring student progress and then intervening when students are not making the progress that we expect. And the development of high functioning teams, because we know that individual teachers can make a huge difference. Teams of teachers working together make the biggest difference. And then um, in implementing that continuous improvement model together. A question before you move on. Um, this was at each school? Yes. And was it the entire staff at each school, including paras and, and That's teachers? a great question. Para educators were involved in most of the, those nine hours. Um, so, and they were, they, some of the days were, um, they were required to be there. And some of them, if they chose to come for that second day, they were, they were paid to be there. Um, for the most part, they were there. And then uh, one other question, just because, you know, year over year, how is this year different when I'm looking at this list of like previous years, would you say? I would say there was more um, consistency across the system in making sure that these these elements were out, were included. There were there was all, always in each each school, and I'll show you some examples. Each school had their own flavor, yeah, but it was all ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I like that. So here's some examples of the different flavors. Um, they each set their own tone, and it really was about optimism. It was about what we're doing together. And these are just some of the themes they have. Raising the bar, fly fearlessly, believe, dream big, work hard. And so these are frames that the principals use to set the tone, not only for those two learning improvement days, but they're using those themes throughout the year to remind the staff. So, you know, we talk about you know, how do we sustain, how do we sustain that hope and optimism? Some of the, the principles are really um, strategic in how they do that, and they, they include a lot of fun as well. So here's some example of how they combined 
that sense of fun and team building so they had games just as we did in, in August at our Leadership Institute and also that that fierce urgency. So one of the principals started the her learning improvement day with this poem by Lynn Manuel Miranda. Good morning, eyes up, hearts up, minds sharp, compassion on full blast. Okay, let's go. And that is up around her school. She copied it. They, that teachers have it on their bulletin boards. It's just like, okay, we, we got this. So I also talked about um, one of the things that they did was really led with data and led data analysis um, and using this frame of clarity, context, and candor. And we're not, it's, we're not expecting that you read all that data, just they really unpacked a lot of data. So here's an example that one principal used. So talking about clarity, which is what, what are our outcomes and what emotions do they bring up for you? So just looking at this, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but what it says is the remaining gaps are even more motivating and require renewed, immediate, and urgent attention. So that's clarity. You can see there um, talks about the, the gains and the gaps. Context. Here, two in five eagles are not at grade level. And so while a significant number of our students experienced expected to above expected growth last year, so there's real cause for celebration, the proficiency rates illustrate existing gaps that we need to continue to address. And then finally with candor, when he asked the question, how, does, how do these results align with our mission? Our mission is an each student mission and anything less for our students and families falls short of our promise. So we feel that the growth and the gaps fuel a level of motivation for each day, each hour, and each minute. So, um, so building that common culture and that common belief, both in that we have the collective efficacy to make this happen, and we're gonna work hard to get that done, and joy comes out of that. So out of that sense of urgency around that data analysis, then we move into what does high quality tier one or universal um, instruction look like? And so it looks like working in teams, working with our adopted curricula and instructional materials. Um, one example here of uh, the flat screens rolling out in the, um, that's North Middle School really focusing on that high level instruction and then working with um, collaborative teams as they work together to monitor student progress on common assessments build those collaborative teams when we have when we find out that students might not have made the progress that we expected then we intervene and we adjust our instruction and it's a continuous learning cycle so they go back to that planning um, at, at all times. And so they built in structures for those teams to meet together. I have another question. Um, the collaborative teams, um, in elementary, I assume that's grade bands. How does that play out um, other than ELA and math in middle school and high school when you have teachers that maybe have a subject area that no one else does? Is, is, are there cross? I mean, in this scenario, obviously not cross across the district, but how does that work? It, it, it varies a little bit. We can really do it in ELA, math, science, things like world language. There are lots of subject areas where there are multiple teachers teaching that same thing. But I've also seen it, and we've learned to do this better, right? So if there's one teacher teaching a subject in three different high schools, they can get together by Zoom, right? Or they might meet. They, so they, they work together because the, the idea is not only that the curriculum is consistent within a school, but across our district. As well as the assessments in that particular subject are Absolutely. consistent. Yes, correct. that's right. Consistent assessments. Okay, so um, I just wanted to close by saying um, that those learning improvement days were nine hours of professional learning that were led by the principals and their teams often, and they were just packed with packed with learning that was focused on um, student achievement. 
and closing gaps. And so we just want to pause a little bit here and ask what helped you, what, in, what you've heard so far has helped you to see how we're focused on increasing student achievement and closing gaps. I did like the clarity, concept, and candor focus. And having it be reflective throughout the school, from the principal down to every teacher in, in, in the same fashion, so that everyone understood, you know, that process of, you know, that, that analysis and what's the data showing us and how do we focus in on those. That was vital, I think, for me to understand uh, my concern, and I do have a, a concern too for middle and high school, but I am glad we're utilizing the technology that we've learned in the past with Zoom to put the teams together, consistent teams, so that those teams can work when it is just one class being taught at each one different school, we can come together as, as a team across the district. And look at that. that that's very good. Jump on that it's just because it doesn't necessarily answer this question, but that was kind of exciting to think about. I talked to a teacher over the summer and said, "What what lessons are you going to keep? Um, you know, of last two years? What what's going to stick?" And one of the things was um, the Zoom capability and maybe teacher conferences, and that's that's here to stay type of thing. But the collaboration between schools, and as we work to have more of an alignment between the schools, especially the high schools. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's exciting. That can be a positive from the last three years of really incorporating that. Yeah. And I love seeing the consistency of those nine hours between the schools. And so I'm not sure necessarily like how that increasing student achievement and closing the gaps, I do see that as hopefully being um, a nice template for each of those schools to have just this a solid start to the year. Thank you. I think also I'm going to jump on what you said because I think it's really powerful when people learn together. Um, just the team building aspect and the themes that the principals came up with, I think that has a, an unrealized benefit um, regardless of the content and all the stuff, but just interacting with um, professionally with their peers for that much time and digging into it. I, I got a feeling to um, with the clarity context of candor, what, what, what Pam just said, um, I really got a feeling, and you, you said that that is sort of joy, but I got the feeling of it sort of does helps with the why, like the big why, mm -hmm. and, and, and that feeling of hope, and that feeling of I can. And so that's what I got, as you were describing it and giving those little mentions, I mean, that, you know, school by school, that that's really thought of as a school. Was that done at a school? School level or at an individual teacher level, those those cards. That was a school. So it was a school, was a school <coughs> deciding what what their big rock is or whatever it is. And I really like that. And I do like the the because my company does this too for for our regions. It's the the must haves, but then um, it, it it you know you have to have mint chocolate vanilla, um, but it is still all ice cream. So you can have strawberry and you know. Gelato and all those other, that's not ice cream, but anyway, it's better. Um, but I really, I really like that, the must haves, and then what, what is your culture? And I think you guys have talked about that too, the, 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 through the years, that, that must list and that, yes. so what are, what are, what are those things that are the, 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 the non negotiables? Thank you. Thank you. I am going to turn it over to Mr. So this year, you, as you can see with uh, Dr. Woods, strong launch to the year, uh, had a huge amount of momentum, we're back in person. A lot of those barriers that we had or those challenges that we were facing at the launch of this time of last year are, are no longer in place. And so how do we keep the momentum going to create great outcomes and improve student achievement for our kids? So um, all roads lead back to student achievement. And this year, as you have seen on our website, as has been previously shared, we have a definition of student achievement in our public schools. 
And up here on the screen, it's showing that students at Everett Public Schools are achieving when they demonstrate both proficiency and growth to align standards. And so it's been a busy three months. So on the right hand slide of this, uh, right hand of this slide, you'll see what the first three months are really like for principals and school leaders as they are preparing to launch the school year and collect their data and get their plans in place for continuous improvement. And so one of the questions was posed earlier, so what's different this year that hasn't happened in the class? And I would say one of the most uh, important things that we've done this year that hasn't been done in the past several years because of all those challenges we we're facing is the intentionality by the way that we plan to get achievement gains and utilizing all the resources that we've been provided um, in the budgeting process and that's been allocated to schools. And so um, this proactive planning and aligned systems to create that sustained um, continuous improvement has been what we've moved forward here in just this, well, just finish that first September month of school and we'll continue through October until school improvement plans are finalized on how so um, with that strong launch, we know that um, while it's been very busy and we've had a lot to, lot to do, time is always the most limiting factor when it comes to working collegially and working um, in collaboration with colleagues. And this work is not an individual or isolated event. We have to work together and we have to have synergy and coherence in the work that we do. So how do we maximize our time that we do have in schools uh, throughout the year to actually um, get student achievement gains. And so even starting back in June, I know that's a little going backwards in this timeline, but starting in June, our principals and assistant principals engaged in some proactive planning around um, collaborative time. And on June 20th, they began planning how we would use valuable resources of time, people, space, and money. On the screen, you can see is a calendar. And this calendar is the school's calendar. Um, and the calendar itself is the teams engaged in identifying all those opportunities throughout the year, staff meetings, a lists, um, all the collaborative time that they had available to them. And when you put it, and you have to imagine that one completely is on here and filled out for school, when you look at it, we actually have a lot of time. What we've not had the opportunity to do is to intentionally use that time because we weren't getting thrown curveballs left and right to start the year. So we started with that, and then we started attaching people to that. So which people in which locations at what time needed to be there to really move work forward. And then we had to look, plan for space. Where is this going to take place in our school or within our school district? And then money, because we know that sometimes the work costs money. Okay. So maximizing the resources that we have and intentionally starting to plan those out was the first step that was new this year to setting a successful launch. Once that was in place, schools went through a process. And this is like a pre-planning towards their school improvement plans. And you've seen this actualized in instructional reviews if you've attended one so far, which is identifying those three to five performance gaps or areas of growth that the school needs to most um, intentionally address, right, for continuous improvement and for achievement to go up. And you've seen that in your IRS that you've attended to this point. Principals are getting very real about sharing kind of, you know, the not so pretty side their data because that's really truly where um, achievement is going to ground is going to be made and then they went through their their three rocks they had in last year's IR or anticipating at that time at the end of the year what might they be as we're moving forward so we can start to plan how are we going to address these once we get our data back here and our data is now starting to come in from from our diagnostic testing and we've already looked at our SBA data as well and then finally what's the three staff um, keep professional development that is necessary to then train up the staff skills to then meet the needs of kids. Okay? So pretty basic, but again, you know, having the opportunity now to create some more coherence in our planning work proactively has been a huge step forward this year. Finally, as we're getting our data to start coming in, and as we start to look at our, our instructional calendars and where the, those end of unit assessments fall, Principals are now engaged as they're looking at their school improvement plan drafts to say, where are those opportunities where data is going to come in and where we're going to work with teams to identify the needs and gaps for kids and then set a plan of action to respond? And how are we going to use that collaborative time and for what exact purpose? So as we finish the month of October, 
each school has a plan in place, not only school improvement plan and their IRR actions and action plans, but they have a calendar of how time, people, place, and money will be up most maximized to get the achievement gains that we're striving for and reach those strategic plan outcomes. Quick question. Yeah. What is EOU? End of unit oh, assessment. Now this, the data that you are using is taken from last year's <coughs> assessments at the end of last year's school year, correct? So using the Smarter Balanced Assessment data was one data set that we utilized in our lid days mm -hmm. um, to start this planning process. The IREDI Diagnostics okay. in elementary and middle are starting to be completed uh, at the end of next week. <laughs> And then they will be meeting in their teams to review that data. And then that is that last portion that then sets their action plans for a school improvement plan gotcha. and then formulates the focus of their collaborative work in teams. Gotcha. Now, what happens with that information? Um, what happens with the reality of educational loss during the summertime and how does that add into overcoming that slide <clears throat> that summer slide in getting the kids ready for the next lesson or next unit that's coming out in say november december time frame if it does not show up on i ready results or the assessments from june well, our assessments in the iReady diagnostic is aligned to standards. So when we see a student's performance and we know which standards they struggle the most in or below grade level in, that information can be used in instructional planning to individualize and personalize instruction. Okay. Example, um, we have a student who struggled in um, double digit addition, but we know yeah. that their grade level lesson, this in two weeks, is going to be on four digit addition. <laughs> okay, just an example. So, in that case, we know which students struggled and don't yet have the skill from grade two, but we need to prepare them to be able to access grade level instruction for grade three. With that information, you can then proactively in small group help those students to learn that second grade and get it to standard for second grade skills so they're ready to access grade level content in grade three. That's an example of how you can use that individualized We use individual data to intervene, yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, what is very exciting about this now is principals are, and their school teams, have a very clear plan of action about how they will maximize time and resources they've been given to get the maximum benefit to close gaps on student learning. And those plans are just being finalized here in this month, and then we're ready to roll for the year. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dr. Meisner? So lots of decisions to make as we get the data in, and you're hearing all the way back in August, and we're thinking, how do we make these decisions? What's the priority? So what's new about this year is that we have introduced a tool, which is the 90-day plan. It's just a tool to help school leaders with their leadership teams to identify the priorities. So that when, as to uh, Larry's point, we are making the best decisions for the time that we have. So they're most targeted to student learning strengths and needs, and then the adult practices that are connected to those student learning strengths and needs. So we're just going to walk you through. Um, you've seen this before, of course. It's nested. Um, the 90-day plan is just a short cycle of improvement, right? So we want two to three 90-day-ish plans within one school improvement. I'll align it throughout. Um, I'm going to just share just a little bit about the, how the questions that are in the 90 day plan help to service these priorities. So, a fair amount of text here, but there's four parts of the 90 day plan that we've been using. The first, of course, is in that shaded area, which is our anchor, which is student learning. So, this is where we're taking all the available data at the time that we have and we're writing these descriptive statements five out of 10, six out of 10. We're using academic data, we're using social emotional. Connectedness data from Panorama. We're trying to paint the picture about where schools are. This happened starting in August. So, a really nice watch because we have initial data to use. 
as we get more data, we can update, like things are still sticking, yep, that's still right, or we might need to shift our, uh, our priority. So that's the first thing. That next part is what are the adult um, practices? Teaching practices, this is significant, and leadership practices, not just the teacher. What are the adult practices in the schoolhouse that we need to be more intentional on to leverage strengths and address needs that our data is revealing to us? Okay, so this is a very um, through line connected way. We know we're doing well when staff who are participating in the professional learning that comes from this are like, oh, great, thank you. This will help me do my job more effectively to help me meet the needs and strengths of my kids. Teachers love that. Right? They want to know that the time they're spending and the energy they're committing is designed based on their students' needs and it's going to have an impact. So real clear connections. Um, then we get into the planning phase, right? So this is where you might see your typical action plan. And this is where we get into all the different resources that Larry just talked about, time, people, space, and money. And we start to see like just the timeline. At this point, we're going to work with coaches. We have like three PD sessions during staff meetings. We're going to use the lift day. We're going to invest in some other resources that we might not have that we have identified that we need. And so that's where we get to the action plan. What's different, sometimes in improvement cycles, we just go to the actions. And what's different about this is we really prompt school teams to ground themselves deeply in student achievement data and an analysis of the instructional practices, the adult practices that are connected. Because that's what we control most. Kids are in school a lot. If we can maximize their time in school every day with effective practices, we know we're going to help them make gains. And the last thing is progress monitoring. And if we've done our job at the very first part, which is to identify the student learning strengths and needs, how we will progress monitor actually becomes really simple. We just say, okay, this is a 90-day plan. In December, what data will we have that's available that speaks to us about these specific priorities that we've made? We have lots of them. Um, and then we can even back them up in between until next three week cycles, two week cycles, and it just gets more specific. So that's in a nutshell the prompts that school leaders and teams are using. We are not rigid. If they have different prompts, we allow them and explore them to go in different directions. But this is a guide to help them identify priorities and make decisions about the resources uh, so they're very targeted and measured. Any questions or comments about the Mandy plan? Yeah, great reason. Um, I'm kind of curious about the, in, in the middle band, it says to implement new instructional practices. And I guess what I'm wondering is how, how much of instructional practices are new or just honing skills and, and where does the past three years play into new instructional practices given where we are today? And, and how much of that is they just didn't learn it in their, you know, there are, years of training or, yeah, or so all that, of the above? <laughs> it's a great leadership question, like with school lead teacher teams. What do we know about these different, okay, well, we do these practices. And there's always something to build upon. There are some things that we just haven't been as intentional with that we need to know where we're at. You know, learning targets, success criteria. These are things that are pretty commonplace that we can bring back now that we're kind of more able to focus on things. There are other areas that are more new. So we have a lot of sort of math. There's more inquiry, there's more student talk. We want student discourse that leads to deeper thinking and mathematical understanding. Dr. Bowden just gave us some like prompts like 15 minutes ago. That's an example of some new practices that we can dose and give tools for to support the effective implementation of those instructions. Does this emerging uh, research drive some of that Absolutely. on learning? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not all new, right? We want to harness the collective intelligence of the school community. Sometimes we just need to reinforce that, spread that. Um, so that's a part of like an asset-based approach. And then sometimes when we don't have the knowledge of the school, we need to go outside and bring it in. Uh, I have the benefit of, of seeing the fifth grade class um, in a group today talk a little bit. Might not have been the 90 day plan, mm -hmm. but I did see some of that new where having those with the coaches sort of seven minds, looking at the data, what's coming next, hearing things like talk from a fifth grade teacher saying, well, I can tell they're not close reading because everybody missed these first two questions. And I looked at the first two questions and like, well, I just know that from knowledge, but it is, that's me as an adult, but it was sort of that 
I saw that as sort of new, and then somebody else said, sort of said, well, what do we need to do to make sure the kids know where to pull it from? And they really strategized how the kids could do that. And it was it was just beautiful to see that 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 it, it was organic because they're all looking at the data. When somebody said close reading, then everybody like just completely understood. One question, final thought before I hand it off. I just want to point out these are questions mm -hmm. versus directions. Mm -hmm. So it's very slight but very significant difference. And it's really funny. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Raskin. Um, and I don't think I could ask for a better setup than some of that questions around what are the instructional practices. Um, because we have spent the last year um, engaged in our strategic planning process developing our instructional vision. And I know that you've seen this graphic before, but it's really helped us to coordinate and align what we expect to see in classrooms. So it's not just your typical teaching. We really have shifted in thinking about um, having students doing the thinking, um, student voices elevated in the classrooms, students are both supported and empowered in that. And so when we think about that, what does that mean to our practice? It really means that we're renewing that coordination and alignment on what we expect to see in our classrooms, not just on curriculum, but also those best instructional practices that we know are actually going to move the dial for our students. So our messaging around this with our strategic plan is that it's not just about the content alone. We're very fortunate we have good curriculum, it's been vetted, it's viable, but also what are the practices that are going to help engage students in a way that's going to provide for them an experience that, um, that it's not just about what do we want students to learn, it's about what experience do we want our students to have in our learning environments and using those standards aligned instructional content, but also the instructional practices. So you'll see things like math language routines where we're asking kids to dialogue and discourse about their thinking, prompting one another, rather than just a teacher standing and delivering, we're really talking about engaging kids in really authentic ways. Um, our science curriculum, while it's aligned to the next generation science standards, it's also inquiry based, getting kids to explore, getting kids to experiment, talking to each other and recording that data and information. So our next step in helping in that pursuit of student achievement is really continuing to focus on cultivating our systemic coordination and alignment with what we expect to see being taught in the classrooms. And we've been really fortunate to always have a board who's continually pressed and championed equity across our system. What happens in a school in Region 3 should be mirrored in what happens in Region 1 and 2. And so our principals, as you've heard, our principals and teacher leaders have been really unpacking standards at the beginning of this year, um, really thinking about how to utilize the district curriculum and best instructional practices. Um, and they've unpacked that student data as well. Uh, with their teams, identifying gaps and areas of focus, as well as strengths on which to build. I think a lot of times we think about, we have gaps, we have gaps, we have gaps, but we also have some strengths on which we can build to help us fill those gaps as well. Uh, so knowing where our students were in the spring with SBA is really important, but collecting the real-time data based um, on the assessments that are embedded within the curriculum, I ready diagnostics, it's not just reflecting on that data, but it's actually utilizing that data to help plan intentionally for what are the next steps. So where are students? Where were they in the spring? Where are they? Where were they in September? Where are they right now? And we're utilizing those end of unit assessments to really say, hey, wow, these kids made some progress on the standard, or they're still not getting it. What do we need to do to shift our practice to intentional, bless you, to intentionally capture and help move um, our students to achieve and close some gaps. So another key focus that we're utilizing those curriculum assessment, um, end of unit assessments, we saw them earlier on a slide called EOUs, and those are our progress monitoring benchmarks. So we know that if a student is did not demonstrate in third grade um, or second grade some success in uh, operations and algebraic thinking, for example, on the i -ready diagnostic, we know that the next assessment that they get in the illustrative math curriculum is wrapped around that standard and we can check for progress. We can also find fixes and other activities to enhance and make sure that we're closing gaps 
so that we're not waiting from spring to spring to spring. We're actually getting opportunities to collect student data, modify and adjust our instruction, and continue to close the gaps so that when they hit the next SBA, they'll be able to do it. But more importantly than just the SBA, we want to close the gaps for students, especially in mathematics. We have foundational skills. If they don't get it in second grade, they might miss more in fifth, third grade. So let's ensure that we're continuing to close those gaps by utilizing those assessments and building in systems of support to do it. So again, here's another reflect and respond. Um, so moving forward, what did you hear in this segment that really helped to hear about our aligned, aligned um, efforts and actions to increase student achievement? And what helps you to see how we're focused on closing gaps? I just had a more question that will get money. But um, <laughs> be, being at Gateway today, um, I really did see in the two science classes opportunity for student discourse. Um, but those are big classes, and one of the rooms is particularly small. So just a question more of when you have kids lined up because that's really maybe the way that that room will fit that number of kids but it just seemed that there there wasn't the opportunity because of the, the size of the classroom for that sort of talk and turn and that discourse versus the other classroom i went to that was probably one and a half times bigger and so the kids did have that space tables and things and so when the teacher said talk and you know turn and talk that you actually had a, 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 a cohort to talk turn to sure. instead of turn to your neighbor um, that could be an opportunity when you're in rows I didn't see that happen um, but it is just sort of how are we getting to the when the facilities just don't allow for it I mean it just felt it, it, it was a disappointment yeah it, it's just the room size and I think one of the things that I love is um, when we have teams of teachers who are able to collaborate even though you may ask the same pose the same question to either clarify or um, produce a, a analysis in a, like a science classroom, when those teachers come back and they're sitting down and they're doing intentional planning around those standards, they can say, okay, so I'm going to do a turn and talk, turn to your neighbor, because it, it's easy to facilitate in the environment in which I'm working on. Um, or what I could do is I could think about like another activity that might just get kids up and moving and moving to a different location or standing or there's different strategies that we can use to engage students in a meaningful way that may not be necessarily limiting. A teacher might also look at just the rows and says, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it that way. But there are opportunities for them to be able to collaborate, not just with each other, but also their, their building leader in talking about how can you adapt in your classroom environment to facilitate discourse in a more meaningful way. So how did we, after, after the IRs and, and what we saw today, how did the, the, the the, the the subject leads and then the, the school leadership supported a teacher who can't see outside of the box and and you know you could I mean I've, I've both classes kids are learning but there's one classroom I wanted to be in and I that's I'm sure the kids are feeling that too and so it is just sort of the I saw 15 minutes so it's no judgment sure. on teaching um, but it is just sort of how do you, you know, how do they, how do you coach? Yeah, and actually one of the things that we've been really focused on is as an instructional leader in the building, principal and assistant principals are one of the first instructional coaches that those teachers have, but also relying on their collaborative peers as well. So when they can facilitate that dialogue, whether it's either in small group or even one on one after I go in and maybe do a formal observation and say, hey, I'm noticing that the dialogue is lower in your classroom, let's talk about some strategies that might help to facilitate that. And that's why um, when Dr. Meister mentioned sending out resources around how do we engage in math dialogue or how do we engage in different discourse and in inquiry-based classrooms, those are the important things that sometimes teachers can't see outside the box. And it's up to us as district level systems administrators to help support our leaders mm -hmm. in coaching for that instructional practice and change. If I might add, and this is why this is a good topic of workshop, is that's why you have common plan that, so you help every teacher sits at that, that table the four teachers the science team okay what's your barrier how can we help you and then that's why you have the principal the assistant principal be the instructional leader with the team and collaborate okay so 
and we should see that across the board. Yeah. Right? Elementary and middle. So we talk about the gaps, we talk about pedagogy and teaching, we talk about more natural merit scholars, we put it all together for the system where everybody collaborates. What's our goal in the building? So when we talk about, you know, one teacher different than another teacher, but if you get everybody to the table, it goes back to collaborating. And when we look at assessing, we do assessments, it's not a bad word, we look at assessments together as a team and say, hey, what are you doing? I see, you know, your class is all different. What can I share or what can you share with me? I think the key is, and what you see even more this year is because the joy of opening mm -hmm. is going to add to more collaboration. It's very hard to collaborate on the screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's almost impossible. So I think those are things that, uh, as we see those things, how do we encourage those instructional leaders to collaborate and sit at the table? Absolutely. I just want to chime in. It, it's interesting, I think, on the, the facilities can either help or hinder some of that work, but the team collaboration and teachers being able to learn from each other and support each other is so key, I think, in the success of entire staff. Principals can't, they're the leader, and yet there, there's so many teachers that need to do that horizontal um, building. And what you were saying before about um, focusing on the student experience, I think it also premiered with the teacher's experience. Brand new teacher versus an experienced veteran teacher, and any kind of coaching that can go on there. But um, so a couple of slides back, you had on sort of focusing on what is the student experiencing, mm -hmm. not just about the content, yes. but are they experiencing that I know I can I can count on my teacher that I can speak up in class and I can I try, and it's an investment in our students and it's an investment in our teachers that um, may not always show up right away, but it will Absolutely. pay off in the long run. Absolutely, and that's our hope. Yeah. That's our hope about constructing a student experience. It's not about filling a cup, it's about lighting a fire. And what that means is when students walk out of our halls, when they walk across that stage, what do we hope they take with them? And that is being able to dialogue and think and question and, and really push their thinking to the next level. That's what student achievement is really all about. I think on the, the last question, um, how we're focused on closing the gaps. I feel like we have been talking about individualized, you know, um, remediation or acceleration or whatever it is for a very long time, but I feel like we're just kind of finally getting there. We, we were starting to see more of that, you know, bring it iReady on board, but then it wasn't used ubiquitously across the district. Um, and then we had COVID and now I feel like I'm hearing more of it, I'm seeing more of it, and, and it's really happening in real time finally. And, and the other thing too, the flip side of that is not only for the teacher to be able to assess in real time, but more students understanding their own capabilities and where they lack skills or they're proficient or above proficient or whatever, whatever level they are. But that conversation and the ownership is really a big change I think in this district. And I think our leaders, our leaders have working with teachers and teachers feeling more confident and competent in it, that increases data chats and having more meaningful conversations about their performance. So students have the ownership. And it's not, learning should never be something done to students. It's always with and it's for. Yeah. And I think that, that our data has given us the platform to be able to have that conversation with our kids in a more meaningful way. I think one of the things that I really enjoyed hearing um, with the 90 day plan, when you said these are questions, not directions. That was very informative to me. It said so much more than just what it said, because it gives people, it gives the instructor as well as the, the, the student the opportunity to question, you know, how am, am I really growing? How am I going to measure that? You know, not that I have to grow. But how, how, how should I measure that? And then also the teacher to measure or be able to ask the question, you know, what more can I do to ensure that the student is, is growing? And then too, when you started talking about your common vision, students doing the thinking. Here again, we, we, talk, we focus so much about the, the four C's, you know, critical thinking. Well, 
let's continue that focus, but having the student ask the question, are you actually engaged in the thinking of this particular problem? The thinking of what's being taught, empowering the student to ask that question too, and being very collaborative, not only at the, the student's level, but at the instructor level, collaborative within their their department, their you know their subject matter expert areas, so they can ask that question. And I, I think you, by doing so, you give the student voice a greater opportunity to be there, to grow and, and elevate too. And I you know notice that's in there as well. So Glad you see that. Thank you. That's that's good. That's yeah. very good. I like that. Uh, what what are we going to focus in on in the future? I'm actually I'm going to turn it over to Dave Peters and he's going to talk a little bit about social emotional. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, an integral uh, component of our uh, focus on student achievement is social emotional learning in every public schools as it really sets that foundation um, both for personal and collective learning um, and it makes it easier um, to provide access to each of our students and uh, you've heard it recently shared that um, our strategic planning work has been grounded in uh, national indicators of school-wide social emotional learning as well as uh, the washington state social emotional learning benchmarks um, and standards and, um, and so uh, we all recognize, and it's even stated in the introductory um, answers to your questions, that acknowledging the importance for all of us, right, coming out of a pandemic, we've all experienced some degree of, of trauma and impact, right, and, and um, so that importance of, of growing in our own emotional intelligence and learning skills around that, really those social emotional learning is those three letters, right? It's not just emotions, but it's also the social components, how we interact with each other. And the pandemic has had effects on that as well. And then the third word is learning, which implies that there are things that maybe we don't know uh, as much about that we could learn, uh, that we could grow in, in our understanding. So we know that with our, our educators and our leaders, right, that they've been affected as well that when they grow in their own emotional intelligence, their own social emotional learning, um, they can develop more of that empathy and sensitivity towards student needs. They're also more present and creative in their planning and their monitoring of student achievement um, and um, just that ability to read the room, you know, and, um, and it also increases their job satisfaction and prevents burnout too over time when they learn to and they're again regulating their emotions that way. And for students who are skilled in emotional intelligence, um, we, we know that that affects the, in a positive way their academic achievement because it positively affects their ability to pay attention, to make decisions, to learn, it affects their memory. It affects things like confidence, right? Their um, ability and willingness to set goals and to take risks. Um, and just to have a better overall experience um, with schools and it's really then bring to life that word thrive, which is part of uh, one of our strategic initiatives a one And so our um, emphasis this year has really been um, getting launched with ruler. You've heard um, this and um, in our efforts towards social emotional learning, we've put it, we've really invested um, at the right time as well with our ESSER dollars that became available that we may not have been in a position to be able to do the things that we're doing now but because of that funding right and um, and as we'll talk about with our learning improvement day even the legislature and the timing of, of certain of the requirements so um, I wanted to just as a context I know um, with the learning improvement day coming up Hopefully you may be able to attend that. And I wanted to help just provide us to set a little bit of a context for you. You'll be learning um, more in depth about this um, from Dr. Brackett. But um, just to help you understand, you've heard the term ruler before. It's an acronym for the five emotional intelligence skills of recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating um, our emotions. And they kind of go in chronological order, 
as we learn these and use these skills. And just like any skill, it takes practice, right? It takes persistence and you've got to try over and over. And when you mess up, you don't just throw it out while well, that didn't work. You've got to keep at it. And over time, the more, the longer that you do it and the more, just like any skill, imagine, remember when you learned to drive, but you had to pay attention to everything you do, but now it's automatic, right? And we can learn these skills in ways that will help us become more automatic in our own goal of emotional regulation. The first is recognizing emotions in ourselves and others. So it's becoming aware of our own physiology, changes in our physiology, um, even being aware of how to interpret kind of our thought patterns, our habits and how we talk to ourselves and, and, and how it affects our emotions. And uh, it increases our own self-awareness, and it also helps to increase our own so our social awareness too. You know, we can grow in this skill. And then in our understanding, that's really understanding the causes and the consequences of our emotions. So once we are aware, we're starting to develop that habit of like, okay, I'm aware of that I'm feeling something. Well, why? Where did this come from? Was there an interaction that just happened? Did someone just ask something of me where now I have limited resources or there's a lot of pressure now something right and interact did i remember something that i was supposed to anyhow it helps to just understand where did the feeling come from and then that brings us to labeling which is arguably the area that we maybe are the weakest in is particularly as adults if i ask you how are you doing what are you going to say fine fine, fine. good but happy mad sad you know? just, I, sorry to interrupt you but it is sort of too in my own learning about this it, it, labeling because kids don't always have the vocabulary so we might not have the right vocabulary but some kids don't even have the vocabulary to know what fine is what anger feels like what joy feels like to put words to those feelings frustration versus anger so will that be part of this training or learning as we move forwards so that we teach kids how to find labels for that. It's interesting. Without right? assigning it to them, but having them find Right. It. Giving them a name. Yeah. Giving a name to their emotions. And notice that it's labeling them accurately. Yeah. Okay. So this is really important because we can look out at, at times and and we may see things that we say, oh, that person's mad and that person's mad. And that's mad. That, everything looks mad. But there's so many more nuances. It may, the underlying cause may be disappointed. I'm disappointed, or I was embarrassed or humiliated, or I'm feeling guilt or shame, right? But it looks like mad. So it's, it's this, yes, it is very important that we learn. And, and students can learn just like when you learn colors or, or things, you know, you can start out with the basics, but so students can, can grow in like that as they learn. Like the paints that scale pictures or something. <laughs> right. And we also, it's interesting too, because yeah. we have um, uh, physical education, yeah. right? Through our school, we have health education, we learn about nutrition. Yeah. So the, the standards now are, are requiring us to be explicit about emotional education so that we learn more about really what has such a, an incredible influence over all that we do. Well, and that's what it is, it's the consequences. If you have a cortisol level that stays high, you're killing your heart. Right. And so it is just sort of how to, one of the questions on, on Panorama is, can you, mod, can you, you know, control your emotions? And so this, I think this is just great. Yeah. So then, and, and really the, the labeling is kind of the hinge of the first two yeah. skills and the second two skills. And so the E is really the expressing emotion. So that's really what we're showing on the outside. That's what people see. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what we feel on the inside, which is the next one, regularly, but that's what we're showing, choosing to show. And that may be influenced by our, um, our, our cultural experiences, our backgrounds, right? Um, it may be influenced by the context, right? Whether I'm in the lobby of the dentist office or a funeral or a campfire with my buddies, right? How I express things is there's different display rules, right, that, that happen. Um, and particularly our, our students, our ML students, or those coming from other cultures, it's tricky for them because they're, they're not used to things that they would express may give different results socially than they're accustomed to. And it takes a while for them to learn those. Um, and the last is, is regulating our emotions, but regulating them effectively, right? So when we say that we mean 
um, and even appropriately, the word oh, before there, that means that you're, you're, you're ex regulating in a way that's beneficial for you. Um, expressing appropriately is maybe beneficial again for you or to others, right? And how you choose to express your emotions, teacher, for example, or someone coming up to an, on an emergency scene, how you choose to express your emotions may be um, a gift to others as well. Okay, and um, so these are some of the things that you're going to learn more in depth about if you're able to attend uh, on the Learning Improvement Day. We're excited about that. And a quick question. Um, I don't know if this is going to be addressed, and, and if it is, just we can pass for now. But what is the age appropriateness for the different levels? It, does it, you had mentioned that it, it's intentionally sequential. Do you start like you know, in first grade or kindergarten with that first basic one and then as they grow or do you address them all at the same time and has the research shown that certain um, the, between the different five do certain things happen at certain ages, I guess, or grade levels? Well, um, those the students uh, down to very young kids, they can learn all five skills. Okay. It's just that you have to right size the detail or the yeah. specificity or the nuances are different at the younger ages, right? Yeah. But those five skills, because they do work chronologically in a sense, it is important, it's important for the young students to learn those pieces, and they can. Um, so another part of, of the, uh, the ruler approach are they have four anchor tools. And so the first is the charter. Um, that's really uh, two questions. One is, how are we feeling? And the second is, um, now that we, how are we going to, what, what strategies are we going to take to maintain that and to keep that going for ourselves? So to create those. Uh, the mood meter is a, a visual guide that helps students or adults plot their feelings. It's again, it's help, it's developing that skill of becoming more aware, recognizing their emotions, and then, um, and also labeling. The meta moment is a, a skill where that it's that uh, focusing on that little space in between a stimulus and a response. There's a little space there and you can, before you react, you can train yourself to pause. Just pause. You can imagine your best self or your better self. How do I want, how do I, how would I see my best self in, at the end of this interaction and in this engagement, this conversation? And then you can come up with some strategies that will help um, produce a more effective or productive outcome. And then you can re-engage in, in that interaction. And again, sometimes you have more time for that. Other times you have just a fraction of a second. And the more you develop these skills, it becomes more automatic. And right, and that's where it can become more clear. Well, I've also heard the pause can be this big, or it means the second thing never happens. Yeah. It can be forever. And so that just, you never, you never move really like to do it. That's right. I like that. And then the blueprint is the, um, it's, it's more of um, for when, when, Things go a little sideways. We have some conflicts. It's more along the lines of the restorative practices that we're used to talking about here and going. And um, so the five ruler skills, the four anchor tools. And um, again, because of the investments that our district is able to make, uh, we have every staff member in the district will have has access to the ruler dashboard account. And within that, they have a course they can take. It's uh, two two hour modules focused on um, an introduction to emotional intelligence and the things that I just shared with you, and then also the rule of tools um, as well. And they can do this as self-paced, they can work on it together. So we're providing clock hours, four clock hours for any staff member in the entire district um, that would like to participate in that. And for our certificated staff, it's likely they will have, they will be doing this outside of their work day typically. Um, we're providing compensation as well as the four clock hours. Can we get access to it just so we can Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I can, nice. can add you to the dashboard. Add us to the dashboard. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I would just like this for myself because yeah. I think I'd be a better leader if I had this and better understanding the language everybody's using. Gotcha. And then, um, you know, as we said, the state legislature has required that school districts provide uh, a day of professional learning on alternating years for equity and social emotional learning emphases. And uh, last year, you remember, we had a very meaningful learning improvement day around diversity, equity, inclusion. And we're building on that this year um, to focus on social emotional learning. And, uh, 
Dr. Mark Brackett, who is the founder of Ruler. He's also the director of the Yale um, uh, Center for Emotional Intelligence. He will be leading our morning session at the Angel of the Winds Arena, where we will, the first time in I don't know how long, our, if our, our entire district might, will be able to be present at the same time, hearing that common message, developing that common vocabulary, these common strategies we can then build on as we move forward. And uh, we're very excited. Live so that it's yeah, is there live? Yeah. Everything? Yeah. Yeah. Be happy. Um, that memorize, that thing. yeah. So and then at lunchtime, our um, implementation teams at our schools will be able to have uh, a working lunch with him, and they're very excited about that opportunity. A little more intimate conversations about the rollout um, that they're working with, and then after lunch, uh, all the staff will be traveling back to their sites to where they'll have school-based or department-based conversations to reinforce what they learned during the time at the arena together and the next steps that are right-sized that they're building uh, for their progress where, where they are along the continuum with, with Ruler or other particular, any other social emotional learning uh, panorama data those kinds of things as well so um, you know as we have said many times like our, our why is student achievement right but the social emotional learning is a foundational how um, that is part of uh, our, our work along that journey. And uh, so, you know, we're very excited about this. And I just wanted to, to take this time now too, if, if you had any questions or comments that you'd like to share or ask um, about next steps in our social emotional learning uh, journey here. I guess I'll just, well, I guess well, I guess the question I should assume, um, that after this live day we'll hear how this is going to be monitored and maybe coached to yes yeah, so uh we'll, we'll give you updates on that so just a background this the secondary school had teams that had ruler training for six weeks uh back in the winter of 2021 and the plan at that time was for last year they were going to roll it out to their staff and then elementary teams had the, the same training this past April and May, and then they were going to roll it out this year. Last year, as we all know, got a little bit strained, if that would be appropriate. Like it was very difficult to provide opportunities for training. We didn't have subs available, yeah. you know, all of that. And so we really, we made a choice. Some schools were further along in, than others, but we made a choice to just reset and, and have the whole entire district start now. Right. But the language is in most no, of the no, but but folks, the reason why I'm saying this is that schools are in some schools are in some different places. Some are a lot further along. All of our elementary schools are just, you know starting to. So when we say we're going to be monitoring, yes, but it's also differentiated to you know come relative to where their experiences have been so far. So it's going to be an exciting day to report to. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Forward. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Brian, back to you. Dave. So to support student achievement, we need to make sure they have the tools and the, and the technology to support student achievement. And so we really start from the first day of summer to get ready for the start of the next school year. And so uh, one of the the, our focus is, is the flat panel project. And so the all secondary uh, classrooms had a, an installation of a flat panel. We started that, we did middle schools in, in August, we did high schools in September. And so that is follows the elementary flat panels that we finished last March. So all of our classrooms in the district have interactive flat panels. Uh, and all of our staff has been trained on initial training on how to use those flat panels. Um, we also spent time making sure coming out of COVID that all of our elementary students had access to uh, one computer per, per person and it wasn't the, you know, we, we, we surplus the stuff that was old, we, we made sure that, that the carts were ready for the, for the teachers. That was a big focus uh, as we collected everything back for the first time after COVID. Uh, and we made sure the teacher stations were ready this summer as well. Uh, the uh, the student laptops at Jackson and Cascade, that's part of the 2016 levy as the life cycle management. So those students uh, got new computers. You can see at the bottom there, that's the, the 
the checkout day at, at Jackson, for example, um, and we we made sure that all of our students uh, at the elementary level, now the oldest Chromebooks, we've, we've discovered and learned that a lot of the digital tools now that our elementary students need, need a more robust Chromebook, so we started that process. We started at Jackson Elementary School this week. Uh, we'll start with Region 1, uh, taking the oldest Chromebooks at elementary and replacing those. So 8,000 in total. That's almost all of our elementary Chromebooks. Do we have any desktops left in classrooms at this point? There are no desktops left in classrooms. It's called a nano, so it's sort of like a mini, looks like a little brick. It essentially is as powerful as the old tower, uh, but every classroom has one of those. Okay. But the, the teacher station is their laptop, yeah. but every classroom's got one of those, yeah. So to make sure the technology is used, we have to make sure there's professional learning. And so that is a, a key part of our department. Learning support is the LMS and LITS. And so we, with the flat panels, we spent this summer, you can see it, the, the top picture there is the early adopters. Every secondary school identified early adopter teachers that came in in this summer got three hours of training with us, and they were part of the lid day uh, training with the staff. So they always have on-site support people that are the early adopters, the ones that were willing to take on the panels. And so our secondary administrators, actually, that little picture there, that's our secondary administrators. We had several sessions this summer with them where they came in and they learned how to use and model with their staff the panels. Uh, but we didn't forget about our elementary teachers. They, they got them last March, but we continue to have tier two, tier three differentiated uh, training for <coughs> our elementary teachers and training our substitutes in Paris. Uh, our librarians, you see a picture there in the middle, spent time with us this summer developing digital citizenship lessons. Uh, we work together to increase resources for our, our, our staff uh, that could be asynchronous so they can access them at any time. Uh, for panel training and such, and we'll continue to build out those resources. Uh, we, and we approved some additional tools and, uh, and other things for staff to get ready for the, the school year as well. Uh, the last thing I wanted to throw in here is because we, so we've got the training, we've got the staff, but we have to make sure it works. And so this is sh sort of shows the, the beginning of the school year. Uh, I don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but just know that the customer service part to make sure our staff and students and our parents are in here as well, have what they need, um, is continues to be a focus for us. And we, we track this every day. And our, our, our goal is to make sure that what's open is closed and that, that they have resolution in a timely fashion. So you can kind of see it start to taper off once we get in, into the year. Um, but it continues to be a focus for us. Uh, digital citizenship, are there, um, I assume, are there standards or guidelines or how do we align there. our instruction and practices yeah there are there are digital citizenship is standards. that a state thing or is it mm -hmm. a yeah and so we make sure our uh, the resources we have align to those standards and so the librarians in most schools it's a librarian that is sort of leading that pd and that training in their school sites so they helped us to develop the those resources for their schools and i think now i will turn over to mr moore thank you very much Setting me up will, it will be longer than my conversation. <laughs> uh, each year, as you know, in the spring, we uh, have our consultant prepare a couple of projections. Our internal staff works with our principals and they begin to develop what we use for the budget. And in this particular year, it's amazingly successful, as you can see. Exactly right at elementary. Uh, we're up three at middle and down six at high school. And so we've balanced our staffing and we have had a successful start without uh, a lot of movement. So that makes the system work really effective. And now I'll turn it over unless there's any questions. Are there any questions? I, I yes, there's a question. Don't leave so fast. Go, go right ahead. I was just going to say um, just great job. And um, because I did hear that um, Penny Creek had a hundred more students than they're expecting, and I 
assured the principal the whole time my daughter was there, it was in the 700s, so that was nothing new. Um, but the fact that three staff were able to move and it wasn't a hiring um, delay, that, that she said that the worst of it is over. Um, but I, I, I just want to say great job that, that we, you know, we, it wasn't a stacking delay. Yeah, just to add, and I think uh, besides budget and the team, HR spent many hours making sure there wasn't too much disruptions in the school. So kudos to HR department as well. Absolutely, it takes a lot of people to create the success. Yeah. Staff movements uh, happy hiring. President, did you? Yes, I did. Um, you said that enrollment remains at 583 below pre-COVID counts. That's correct. Now my my concerns are uh, are we seeing a larger number in our virtual academy? Are we seeing they're included in the counts? Yeah. They're included in the counts in the virtual academy uh, is down to about uh, under 200 students, and so they reentered into our school system for the most part, and so we're seeing the trend is to defer that in-person. Do we have any idea if these are students that would have come here or in our private sector uh, schools or they are there more in home, you know, uh, online sources that they are taking advantage of? So that's the journey we're about to embark on. Hopefully, enrollment consulting as we move toward next year. I know on the screen you've got an enrollment presentation. We aren't seeing really strong trends. We know that some people are moving outward in terms of affordability. So most of us in this area have not seen the uh, enrollment recovery. Districts like Lake Stevens have seen uh, enrollment increases. So uh, it's a combination of things for sure. But that's something we'll work on uh, in the next few months. So you're, but you're saying that our, our area schools are, are seeing similar things that are the neighboring districts, yes. Okay. Whereas the students is seeing yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See if I need some professional learning for the remote. <laughs> so we just have a couple of little updates from um, Communication. So when we kicked off the year, we did some website updates. So things like COVID, the CEP program for meals, things like that. We had to get everything updated and make sure that all of the new office managers and staff that worked on their websites so knew how to do those things. In addition, we added about six or seven new videos to Parent University, things like um, ESAT, SAT, um, parenting in the digital age, some pieces like that. Um, and then we also this year have started, you know, last year we talked about the fact that we were acknowledging all major religious holidays. And this year, the diversity, equity, and inclusion department put together a, a calendar, or not a calendar, basically a spreadsheet of all um, holidays and observances. So we're starting to acknowledge all of those. And just so you know, there's a lot. So like October, there's 31. <laughs> I know. Um, and so there's one today at sunset. Yes, there is. So we were going to be done by sunset. I promise. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of those will be new this year that you'll see coming through on social media and on the website. Um, the other thing we did last spring, we kicked off um, the first um, e-newsletter to families at the beginning of the second quarter, so that's semester. And we did that again this year to kick off a school, but we did it for um, staff as well. So that's a new piece. You can see down at the bottom is the image that it looked like. And the nice thing is that we have about 2,500 staff and we had about 3,500 views. So um, either Ian liked to look at his picture over and over and over again, <laughs> or we had some pretty good um, reception on that. And then on the family newsletter, um, we have about 20,000 families, right? We have um, over 28,000 visits. So we think that that's actually getting some um, pretty good momentum so we're going to continue to do that and no memes were made out of anything or no memes yeah. no <laughs> so the other piece um is about our let's talk that we have on our website now there's two pieces to that and i think some people get confused so there's the chatbot piece which is the 24 7 virtual assistant and then there's the dialogue piece so for the chatbot piece that's where people can put in any question and any time of day and they're supposed to 
be able to get an answer and it gets smarter over time. Um, so we've been getting, a, we've gotten in the last 30 days about 450 questions, so it's well used. Mm -hmm. You can see down at the bottom, at the kickoff of school, it helped really well because we thought through the questions that people usually ask and we put those in ahead of time. So some of the things were like, I'm a freshman, what supplies do I need? Or when does ECAP start? Or when do I get my schedule? Those are all questions we knew ahead of time. So if they put in that question, they could get that answer without making a phone call. Is, was, is it also, sorry about this, is it also smart enough um, that if they don't use the exact same phrase no. to put in? <laughs> but that's what we do. We go on the back end and we put in alternative ways of asking the same question. Same questions. Mm -hmm. And then if people ask, we can see the questions people ask, and if they aren't asking it the same way, then we add that in or we change it around or we redirect it. So we're working on the back end to make it smarter. So it's getting smarter, but it's never going to be 100% smart because people ask questions like, um, what time is the homecoming dance on Friday? Yeah. I, I, that's a question we just can't possibly have in there, right? Because we don't know what schools are talking about. Like kids supposed to wear yellow today? Yeah. And then the other thing is, um, is we do get about one third of them are like spammy questions, like what's 10 plus 10, or are you a boy or a girl, and those, those kind of questions. So we have to kind of filter through those. But I really think it has been helpful to have some of these questions offloaded from office managers getting the phone calls. Mm -hmm. So we're working on getting that um, smarter every day. Uh, the other piece is the dialogue, and those are the ones where people ask questions and the email gets directly sent to a staff email where they get the question answered. So that is not a 24-7 thing. We guarantee a 48-hour turnaround. But those questions, you can see we've had over 2,000 of those dialogues sent through. And at the end, if they want to, they can rate us on our customer service. And currently, out of uh, 1 to 10, our customer service rating is at 8.6. So, so that's pretty good. I think um, the staff are doing really well at answering those questions. There is a question. Yeah. Check, check out the chat. Yes. Because my company has a similar thing where I, I used the wrong word and then I got a Robert Frost quote. Oh, well, at least it was a nice quote. It was a waste of my time. <laughs> but if, so, so if somebody does ask something that it can't answer, how, how, how are they notified? Like, what do they see? If they get the wrong answer twice, okay. then they're given the option to send an email. Oh, okay. okay good. And then those emails come to communications department and we get it answered however we get to. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So the last piece about telling our story, so um, we have been much more proactive this year and trying to get our story out there. I don't know if you know, but the Herald now has its own education reporter, so we've been able to work with her quite a bit. And just now that we kind of have that rhythm back again, we're trying to get stories out sooner and um, I think are getting much more traction on those things. And then, of course, we have community engagement and um, that is in two days. So hopefully you all are going to be able to attend um, one of the Let's Connect sessions. The nice thing is this year it's in person. So we have three Let's Connect sessions, one held at each region, and we're excited to have people back in person and still be able to have those same dialogues that we had when they were on Zoom, but to have them be there with their administrators and their regional and be able to um, follow through on these great questions about the kickoff for the school year. So that's all I have. I heard today both, both of my schools, the schools I visited, um, the school level uh, parent engagement, um, diverse groups or non or, or diversity within the group. And um, that was really nice to hear the intentionality about those, those parental engagements. Yeah, that's school. great. They're working really hard on that for sure. Yeah. And feedback. Thursday's so Let's Connect, that's going to be collected and shared out like that. Yeah, on the engagement page on the website, which is under the district tab, the feedback that we get from parents on Thursday or community members or whoever's there, and then action steps that we may take from that will be on the website within a couple of days. Cool. Yeah, quick question. Who uh, oversees the school websites? Who makes it's those kind of different for each school. Some some have um, office managers, some have librarians, some. You know, it's a, a staff. Person. It's a staff yeah. person, but they. Does um, anyone monitor that? Because I, I just I see stuff sometimes that's really outdated or um, or not 
no dates. No <laughs> dates. You know, like I'll, I'll go online to see, you know, when they're having whatever event because I may be interested in attending something and there's just nothing on a calendar or today I saw a teacher that was retired last year and things oh, like that. Oh, there's a teacher on there. So that should be an automatic movement that happens on the back end. Yeah. But as huh. far as okay. dates that are occurring, um, we will send a friendly reminder about that. Thank I'm you. Just, yeah, I'm just yeah. curious. Or, it sounds like it's, it, there's a lot of variations. That's good enough. The, the, I was looking before school started at who this school leadership was, and it's like a couple of schools finding the staff list and who they were within the staff was very difficult. So it is just sort of like a <laughs> way. uniform. And uh, it was it one at least one of the schools I looked at. I could not tell you which one, but it would be my liaison schools. It was hard to it was it was hard. To, it was they hard are all templated, so they should all be yeah, exactly the staff, same. But maybe they weren't fully filled out because you know we still get new staff yeah. right up to the day. Yeah, it was school. leadership that was hard to find. Yeah. This helps us because we have the regionals here and we have Brian Beckley here, so if we could just staff get with that. That'd be great. That helps. It's like, are there expectations for when it gets updated? Absolutely. Or when it it, it when should be updated. You know, I always looked at it, updating every time we got paid. As a principal, that's what I did. That update up so everybody remembered on payday, he updated the web page. So we have the regionals here, we have Brian's team here. And we, this input's really helpful because I just want to comment we have, um, you've heard for many years in public education about transparency. Yeah. You have transparency now, we have 2,000 people writing comments, and we get back in 48 hours. So that the public doesn't know that ch chatbot, uh, chat, chatbot chat, chat, uh, chat. We're one of the few districts doing it. Like, I, I compliment uh, Kathy Reeves and, and the team, and Mike Gunn, and everybody else that started way back when, about three years ago. But when we have the web page, we've got to get those web pages updated, right? And yeah. We should make that the district better. one is great, and it's yeah. really yeah. easy to yeah. use. It's just there's a lot of variation on the, it, and it, that's yeah. where a parent would go. And that's what I was thinking. Schools. They go right to the yeah. schools. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. But a parent who's trying to find the principal, one of the five or six schools, I, it was hard to find. Really, really good feedback. And there are there are school website standards, and I think the, the monitoring needs to be. Ramped up and then I take the files for that periodic as we get. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. The bell schedules need to also be listed in, I guess, on the first day of school. When, and I know this was some time back. I went on some of the websites and I couldn't even find the bell schedule for those particular schools. And so even listing those, because that's an important event. And that's what parents want to see. I'm sure it's been a while since the first day of school. So I'm sure they're all updated on that one. But that's one thing that I, I would look at first thing. Yeah, we believe they are. That's one of those, the, the, the standard bell schedule, the regular bell schedule, it's, 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 it's the standardized at the bottom of their, of their home page. But you have to take a look at that if there's a big problem with that issue. So we are in our, our uh, final home stretch here and wanted to provide an opportunity just for some closing comments. Um, wanted to again sort of reiterate that that through line here with hope, optimism, plus strategies equal success. And we hope that you have seen evidence of those systems level strategies across the system, both instructionally, operationally. Uh, Dr. Salzman has been absolutely uh, focused um, in focusing our team here, folks in this room, and our larger collective team, and out in the, among the teacher corps, and the para corps, and everybody in, in food service, I think you can see some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the Twitter history there in terms of just the celebrations out there on, on uh, all roads leading back to student achievements. So we want to thank Dr. Salzman for establishing and re-establishing that as our core mission and what drives us forward and up to and including symbolic things that are on every screen in the district to how we open our meetings intentionally or more intentionally than before and uh, just checking ourselves constructively and um, challenging one another to do that in our, in, our, in our time together. So with that, I wanted to um, invite you to uh, share any last Closing comments, thoughts among each other or with us? I want to say this is one of my favorite special meetings.
questions that we've had in a long time. There's a whole lot of information, um, but it, it it really helps helps me and I and, and especially for the people that who will watch this um, really understand really sort of how the sausage is made and um, for schools and just how many people outside of the school building it takes to make the school building work. And, and I think it's a parent's perspective is what happens in the classroom. But I really saw that just all the great support that happens throughout the district so that that classroom can function. And, and I think this really, really just showed that high level of everything that it takes to make that classroom function. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would ditto that comment. The intentionality of the work being done right now is just phenomenal. I feel like we're, we're seeing the end of a lot of preparation. Yeah, we are. It's too long time yeah. ago, and, and it's yeah, it's it's paying off. So kudos. It's really great to focus on what are your feelings and what is what are your parameters for going forward, and this sets the stage for the rest of the school year, and this is that high level. These are the parameters, and there are a lot of great parameters, and uh, it's intentional. And I like the optimism plus hope plus strategies for success. It's really, you know, asking the questions in that direction. I like that. I'm going to have to stick with that. I'm going to have to take, take that away with me. You know, so I appreciate yeah, that. <laughs> so thank you. It was very good. I, I really enjoyed this one. Work study. So, are there any further questions? If there are no further questions, then this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry.